Simon Dardick. You know the founder, you came on a year after no, no, started, no, no. right? Yeah, right. Okay. Basically, Vehicle Press, we grew out of a, uh, an art gallery, an alternative art gallery called Vehicular. It was the second artist-run gallery in Canada. That was like 1972. And there was an artist by the name of Tom Dean who bought a, a printing press. It was an old ATF chief, it was called. And it had a ba- it was a bastard size. It was 14 by 18, which is kind of a weird size. Apparently, the story goes that that, that machine was used to, to to print maps at the at the front because it was like it could take a beating. He bought this press and used it to bring out a magazine called Bozar Magazine, which was okay. quite a wonderful ephemeral magazine, art magazine. It came out in, in the 70s. And the, the apocryphal story is that for the second edition. The printer caught his hand caught in it or whatever, and it just everything everything ceased about the magazine. I think the magazine ceased too, but the press just sat there at Vehicle Art Gallery, which was and I found this out only in the 1980s when we published a book on the story of jazz in Montreal, that it was an old club called the Montmartre, and it was a, a blind pig in, in the 30s, and so you go up the stairs and you you enter enter the club, mm-hmm. which is like all these hardwood floors with lodges which was great for performance art in the 70s and doing large, large color-filled paintings. So it was like a great spot for that. And in the back, in the kitchen, is where the, where the, where the press was, was this printing press. And it was like, like terrazzo-tile floors and about 20-foot-high ceilings. It was an amazing space. And a couple of people in 1973 started gravitating around this press, got, a, got someone to print on it, to use it, and for about six months they were actually printing books on it and other materials for the gallery. And I, I appeared late summer after they had been been established for people that were actually printing on this press. I walked in and uh, because I had done magazines when I was in high school and whatever, and I had I needed money. I was broke. And I, I was painting and I had a studio, and uh, I be, I walked in. I became the manager and the typesetter. I learned how to typeset. Oh, okay, My, on the job. On the job, my, yeah. my my buddy Guy Lavoie, who we still we share sort of country place together near Montebello, Quebec. He went to one of the CJEPs and learned how to operate a multi-lith printer. And basically, we're a group of people. Uh, we eventually formed a co-op. We were the first printing cooperative in, registered in Quebec in Quebec City, Cooperative d'Imprimerie Vehicle. And our imprint, our publishing imprint, was Vehicle Press. And it sort of just came out of that gallery. And the whole Vehicle thing was, when they established that name for the, for the gallery and for the press, it was the first meaning in uh, Robert, the French language dictionary, which meant a transference of ideas, a vehicle of ideas. Oh, yeah. So that's why we sort of, we have as our logo, though, is, is, a, is a horse. It was like having fun with the idea of vehicles. And, and for a certain point of time, I'll show you, we had some stationery, which had a 1949, I don't know why 49, Ford on the, on the front of our stationery with, with our phone number on it. And on the back, we had the rear end of the car, of the back of the, the stationery. We had great fun because we were printers, so we could print whatever we wanted. Mm-hmm. But we, we printed for other people, mostly uh, social groups and art galleries. We were considered to be the non-sectarian press in, in the city. We would print for various political groups, and uh, we didn't pick sides, and for the and for the artistic community. In fact, a funny story is that during the Olympics, a Marxist Leninist press in town came, approached us and said, "Listen, we're really concerned that the RCMP is going to come and and maybe do damage to our press. We're going to close down for a few weeks. Would you take our customers?" Which okay. was an absolute riot because yeah. we never used up so much red ink in our lives. Uh, so anyway, it was fun. And so, scythes and, and, and everything, yeah. whatever you yeah. know. Yeah. So we did, we did we did printing for the community, and we printed uh, we did our, our literary books. At the beginning, we did artist uh, art books or art. Yeah. I should say catalogs. Artist no artist cre- yeah artist created books and catalogs for like the City Bronfman Center, which at that time had an art gallery, and, and we did our own books. And in many cases, uh, some of the odd sizes were the, were, were the result of printing on the offcuts, the paper left yeah, over yeah, from the books yeah. uh, that we printed. So it was, it was exciting. And, you know, we moved from one acronym to another. We were either on UIC or, or, or uh, CYC or, you know, name the acronym. Wherever we could get some money, that's what we did you right. know, to survive. What's the first book that uh, officially uh, that uh, Vehicle published? The first perfect down book was probably a book called Honey by Claudia Lapp. What I have downstairs is I have a little, just a little pile that's sort of a chronology. And it was a book called Honey. And I remember it was sort of our, our crunchy granola period. 
<laughs> and we we actually went to a printer of honey labels, honey can labels, and had them because they had beautiful designs of bees and flowers and everything, and had them print her name, Honey, Claudia Lab. That was probably one of the early ones. And I'll show you a couple of the others too, but there's one called Vegetables, poems by Ken Norris, and drawings by Jill Smith, drawings of vegetables, and they're poems about vegetables. We printed on craft paper. Okay. There was a, actually a, a sort of a design contest at that, in, in, I think it was 74, 75. And uh, they gave us an honorable mention for all, I think, the crunchy granoli, granoli-ness of it because we approached W.H. Para uh, Nursery. We had seeds under his own name. And he packaged seeds for us with fewer seeds so that we could affix the seeds on the cover of the book. I oh, mean, that's This is great. the ultimate in, the, in, in sort of what we thought then was ultimate great ideas. But it's a cute little book. You know. You're really appealing to the... Uh the collector in me. Oh, is that right? Really, don't, because... I don't know where you're going to find a car. I have just like one or two cars. Right, right. But, that, you know, that, that's that's the challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so speaking of, yeah. of that, uh, perhaps we could l- talk about uh, some of those books that are the funkiest or the ones that you've had the most we, fun doing or the ones that you're proudest of having Well, you produced. know what I should do? We should go downstairs so I can okay. show them to you. Sure. Because it's a little, uh, first of all, it's a great device. I know what I'm talking about. Yes, sure. But also, also you can just see the books that we're talking about. Okay. Okay, so why don't we go, why yeah, don't we go downstairs? Do you want to close your devices here? Well, I'll just carry them with me. Here we go. Take your glass, too, if you want. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you're going to fill these glasses up again, right? Indeed. Great. Yeah. And again, and again, <laughs> and again. It's delicious wine. Yeah, it's quite wonderful. Yeah. Nancy, yeah. we're going to go downstairs. Okay. Um, we're, 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 we're doing some renovations here. So. Now, do you have a hand free? Uh, no. no, I do. Okay, because, no, why do I? Oh, to hang on? They're, they're crooked stairs. Oh, okay. I don't want you to fall. Sure. It's a bit dark. And there's baskets everywhere. Okay. This is sort of the industrial part of the house. Right. So the marketing person works out of here. Okay. Great. That's um, Maya. Maya. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is, I mean, it's, it's great. I'll tell you, it's great working out of the house. Oh, look at that lovely flower bed there in front of your window. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Here, we'll just sit down here. Yeah, we should probably turn that music do down. That there we go. How many books have you produced uh, all, all told well, probably so far? Probably about 375. We were also distributors oh, of, like uh, of literary presses. What I'm looking at is uh, publications, 1976, Vehicle Press just a a listing of uh, all sorts of different publications. So what you have here, these are all the copies of books, single copies of books we've published over the years, missing a few. So you've got your prize winners at the top, eh? the GGs? Yeah, some of them. And here's the more recent ones. Uh, Okay, so... so The wonderful thing about big printers, we could take the time to um, just have fun, you know? Yeah. And it reflects, it's an interesting transition from, or, or indicating our, our commitment to doing artist-created books, too, because you have, I'm going to show you one, because I know you're interested in, in unusual books. Mm-hmm. Here's a book, I mean, this is like really exper- experimental, it's called 15 Unedited Poems by Mario Diacono, okay. 1974, Vehicle. And, and you can see we had fun because we could, you know, this is on our own time. It's die cut. Not just on the cover, but going through to the, the, the uh, title pages. The, the half title page. Yes. And then the poems themselves <laughs> are, are, really, are really grids. This is poem number one, 15 by 30 words. Let's <laughs> fill in the blanks. This is like, you know, we were, we were connected to an art gallery. We came across really interesting people. And Mario Diacono was a very interesting guy because he in Italy he had been the sec- the private secretary to the uh, the famous uh, Italian poet Giuseppe Ungaretti. And anyway, I'll tell you when we arrived at our gallery at, at the gallery press in the mornings, we never knew what we were going to see. 
It could be feces under glass filling the room. It could be Joseph Boys. I mean, it could be it could be people who are doing part of the fluxus movement. There were so many tendencies going through there. It was a very exciting place to be. We vibrant were, and vibrant. Uh, creative. Yeah. So that is like an unusual book. So you're wedding the uh, the image with the word. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and pushing the limits of what is a book. Yeah, you know what is this? Yeah. Someone will look at this and what is this? These are just like grids. Mm-hmm. Poem number ten is six by twelve words, and there's no words. It's just no. a grid, and it's a numbered copy. Yep, yeah. this is number fifty-three out of a total out of 199. And this is the title of this is fifteen unedited poems. Great. Okay. <laughs> Maybe if they were edited, there would be a difference. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anyway, I thought enjoy the definitely yeah. Of, uh, Typically, what we're doing in these mm-hmm. in these conversations mm-hmm. is to, is to get a, a feel for the history of the press itself, but then very much to encourage uh, listeners to get out and try and acquire these books in used bookstores. In some cases, as you know, it, it can be a real quest. The greater the thrill, you know, the harder the oh, absolutely, uh, you know, the Absol- hunt, absolutely. You know. Oh, here so, we are. So this is vegetables okay. that has sort of in this Art Deco type in caps, just vegetables on the cover, and then you have the W H Perrin seed packet, very flat, as I mentioned to you. They made them custom for us. Yeah, glued that's, onto it. That's glued on. It says eggplant. I love it. And it's vegetables, poems by Ken Norris, drawings by Jill Smith. And they're really beautiful, beautiful drawings. This is I think, Kohlrabi. And in fact, the poet wrote it for Jill. This is the title of the poem. Kohlrabi. I know nothing of Kohlrabi. Its design and properties exist beyond the periphery of my vision. Your drawing of it, etc., etc. Yeah. But what's great is that we used to go to paper converters. Uh, I don't what's know if you, that? A paper converter was paper companies that existed on the crumbs of the big companies. Mm. And what they would have is they would have, particularly for smaller printers... They would have ends of runs of paper, and they'd have sometimes paper made for a special edition. But you know, once the edition's over, the, the, what are they going to do with this particular paper? It's cut in a, in a spot exactly. size. Exactly, precisely. Yeah. So the drawings are printed on this this, this sort of laid paper, as oh, you yes. can see, yeah. which was used for an edition. We don't know where, but this is what the converter, the guy that they're called paper converters, uh, for an edition of Shakespeare somewhere. 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 <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's got pretty good credentials. Yeah, paper. exactly. So yeah. the illustrations yeah, are on that delightful. paper. Yeah, it's really neat. That, that's really such fun. a lovely little book. Yeah, it's really And nice. what year is that? This was 1974, I believe, and then we reprinted it in 75. Seat packet is compliments. W.H. Perrin and Company. First printing, March 75. This is the second printing, January 1976. And the title again is Vegetables. Vegetables. And Period. it's by... Poems by Ken Norris, drawings by, by Jill Smith. Okay. And I just saw a bit of our promotional. Oh, isn't that great? It yeah. a promo- which is lovely, because these, this stuff is so ephemeral. Look at this. Margaret Atwood's talking about vegetables. Yep, yep, yep. Neat, eh? So many thanks for beautiful <laughs> vegetables. It was delicious, Margaret Atwood. Funny, and eh? And Alden Nolan. I liked it very much indeed. So much, in fact that I show it to people who visit me and say, hey, look at this, it's good, which is something I don't do with many books. It's kind of cool. Then you have Bill Katz, Library Journal, saying a tasty, wise salute to the subject of the title from Vague Press. And that's the prize we, we got, honorable mention for Canada's National Book Competition, uh, Design Excellence, Look of Books, 1975. And, of course, you're only going to find this in the second edition. This isn't that's in the right. first, because yeah, no one exactly, said anything about exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. So okay. that was one little thing I yeah. thought I'd show you from our crunchy crunchy yeah. granola pack. And this is honey, yeah. Claudia Lab. The honey label, and it's just very simple. And now did you go to a, you went to a printing house that we, did honey labels Exactly, for I don't know, actually, I don't know if we gave, gave them credit or anything. I don't think mm. we did. We weren't so careful then. Now I'd give them credit. Yeah, we went to a creator, a printer of labels for honey cans, yeah. and, because they're quite beautiful. And uh, he printed us labels just for this edition with the author's name and the title of the book, Honey by Claudia Lapp. You've got kind of a rice paper in the front. Yeah. It's a, it's a oh, little, it's laid as well. Yeah. It's yeah. A little, yeah. So we had fun doing you did, this stuff. Yeah, yeah. This one is uh, 73 and this is a revised edition 77. Yeah. So Coach House started up in 65. Oh, that's right. They, yeah. So they, they, were, uh, they were about a decade ahead yeah. of, uh, or seven or eight years yeah. anyway. Yeah. Uh, them and another press called Intermedia Press, which also was publi- were publishers and printers and then died away. Of course, you had Tim Inkster. Too. Tim started in 75, I think it is. Yeah. The 70s were sort of the halcyon days. The economy was great. People had money. People like us. And people, governments had money to promote this kind money. of important work. It's exactly. And now exactly. you have to yeah. scream and beg. and. Yeah. and 
Yeah, I mean, we were sort of more grassroots than, than Coach House, uh, you know, because we, we did a lot of printing for political groups. Well, and you did outside printing. Outside printing. They were all stoned down there, too, though, so well, well, you guys probably were as well. I think we were. This is why I need lists <laughs> yeah. to look at. Yes, so, yes, that's what your memory. It's an aid memoir. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. we had great fun with this. Uh, yeah. The epigraph here is, advice to poets, don't leave the bed too soon. You can't come with words. It was those kind of days, you see. Yeah. That gives you an idea. Now this is this is great fun. Okay. There was a fellow called Opal L Nations, a Californian, I believe, who came to Canada and worked his way across the country. Spent some time in Toronto. I think had some books published by Coach House, books published by us. Stayed here for a couple of years, and then he left and went back to I think San Francisco, whatever. But he had a very fecund mind. Okay. Good. He did really wonderful sort of cutout stuff from books, and so here's like a, a soft cover book with a with a dust jacket, French uh, gate. Yep. Yeah. And yep. this is called, called Inter. Uh, it's called it's called Intersleep, the box in which he keeps his voice. <laughs> we just. Again, we just had great fun doing this. Opal was really born in Britain in, the, in I think, 1941. We even did a gatefold in this book. In the, uh, in the center? Yeah. Or? His stuff was, the, he used sort of like vintage books to kind of take things together, and sometimes his own drawings, right. to kind of then have, use, you know, have various bubbles above people in the pieces cut out of magazines where he put it in his own text. And they were sometimes humorous, commenting on society, sometimes a bit sexual... Mr. Reginald Thinsgrop expresses his feelings on how he thinks about food. And they, yeah, cornflakes, boiled eggs, whatever. We had, it was a lot of the stuff was sort of conceptual art. We glommed onto it and loved it. So that's a neat book. How much was this? $3. You see, now. In, in 1978. Can I'm, you believe it? Yeah. I'm just itching to go online and see if, see if we can find a copy. I would like to know if you Wouldn't can. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. That yeah. Okay. Isn't that neat? Uh, moving ahead a little bit, yeah. <clears throat> do you know this book? You know, I have, uh, I guess a couple of years ago, I I got a copy of one of the original... Uh, Sivens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've got that in my collection. So what can you tell us about it? Well, you know, it was, it was a, a magazine, that, it was a literary magazine, Montreal literary magazine, uh, edited by Eileen Collins, okay. who was part of a group of the literati of the, of the period in the 50s. She published, really, it was only published for... for for about two years, between 53 to 1955. But what was wonderful about it is that it reflected the scene of Montreal at yeah. the time. So you had Leonard Cohen, Eli Mandel, Louis Dudek. Well, Robert Creeley wasn't part of the scene, but contributed to it. Gives you an idea of what was going on then. Phyllis Webb, Ray Souster, Irving Layton, uh, Avi Boxer, Sid Corman, D.G. Jones. I mean, it was like quite exciting. Yeah. So we basically took, it was mimeographed. As you know, if you yes, have a copy, I do. and the yeah. cover was silk screen. Digest side. Yeah. So we approached Eileen, who eventually ended up living with Louis Dudek. This cover photograph has got to be, to me, the most wonderful photograph of all, because it was in Leonard Cohen's parents' country place in the, in the Laurentians. Look at the moose head in the right. picture. Can you believe it? And there's Leonard with a the guitar. And there's Leonard with the guitar. Mm -hmm. There's Eileen Collins. And what we did, I've always wanted to do this in a book. You know when you see outlines of characters and a little... With the numbers to, to tell you who tell they you are. Tell you who they are. Yes, I wanted yes, to do this in a book, yes. and we did it in this book. But on that cover, yeah. Yeah, and it was their friends at the time, which was like, uh, you know, Wanda, uh, the Rosinskis, who were like, he was a sculptor. Mm -hmm. And anyway, you know, so that, that was their, that was the scene at the time. So you're uh, you're really bringing bringing attention to this this to, important yeah time. publication yeah fifties yeah. and sixties yeah and then we had a book launching here at the house so and, sorry, and we, when was sorry. this when was this it was published this. in nineteen eighty three so a lot of the people were still alive oh, so right. we invited them to the house we had a launch and we tried to recreate the scene so we had Marion Scott the artist we had Frank Scott we had Louis Dudek we had they were all here and that photograph was taken in our living room. This is a very interesting photograph because you have Irving, Frank, and Louis together. Irving and Louis had sort of this disagreement where they didn't speak to each other for years. So here they were feeling really good with each other at this event. It was covered by the Gazette at the time, Doris Giller, you know, who I loved. At that time, I was probably the only publisher in Montreal that spoke to her. Because? 
because everybody disagreed had, had because she was a very forthright person right spoke and, her mind and there was always an ar- always arguments and i i've always felt well that, because of the fact that she didn't give glowing do this or do or? that or didn't review a book or whatever oh, okay, she okay. was the book ed- book editor yeah. because that and my feeling has always been that you know my duty is to my authors and i don't care i don't get into these kinds of arguments and i loved her i thought she was just great and she came she covered good writer this, was, this good writer this was her photographer from the gazette that did that picture they did a full page when, when, when would this ever happen again? a full page on this event at our house on the party on the party and all the people who were here it was just <laughs> well great. i mean it no, was it's worthy of covering it was you know. yeah but there's many things that are worthy and i don't think necessarily they would get covered okay so, so what you've done is you've paid homage to this magazine absolutely. by printing uh, in the pages you've basically duplicated all of the editions correct indeed we did i mean yeah. every we've every cover indicates of, of each edition indicates the section and uh, you know no editing done except you know it's exactly what was in Sivan. you know to, you're right in using the word homage because yeah. you know i grew up in kingston i had all my literary heroes when i came to montreal and and you know became a publisher it's one of the things that i wanted to do i wanted to do books of current things that were happening yeah. but i also wanted to publish uh, our history and I've, yeah. I've tried to do that as much as i uh, as much as i could well it's you know it's funny that's what motivates me to do these interviews yeah is i i really yeah. want to bring attention document it. well yeah. document but just bring attention yeah. to people who've done wonderful things and that that more people should know about them yeah. You know, I think that's a, so. Yeah. That seems yeah. to be a motive, motive of yours yeah. as well. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. So I was so happy to do this book. I, look, I came at a time where I was very lucky, where I could still meet these people. So I'm, I can remember. And publish them, I guess. Did you or not? I published Louis, but I can remember one day Louis lived in, in Louis and Eileen lived in Westmount on Ingleside Avenue, and I remember going there. We used to hang out there a lot. I remember there, and I think I think the poet Andrew Farkas was there too, and I can't remember who else. But we haven't to be there when Frank Scott was there with, with Louis. We were in their dining room. One end of the table was Louis. The other end of the table was Frank. And it was like watching intellectual ping pong. We were on the sides. And us young guys, you know, Frank would say something, Louis, I read in the Fortnite review, uh, blah, 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 blah. And I think, and then Louis would say, Frank. And we'd be going back, our heads going back and forth, <laughs> swiveling back and forth. Mm-hmm. It was quite exciting. Mm-hmm. It was quite a mm-hmm. thrill to, to see this kind of... Repartee. These, these and... two intellectual giants, really. You know, And I think Louis, to a certain extent, hasn't received his due. Yeah, because I've he heard was that not, before. He was selfless, whereas Irving was... Self-aggrandizing. Exactly. And, Louis was, and Louis was not. No, he gave a lot of opportunities to others. and didn't, He did. He, yeah. I mean, his essential series, the series he had at McGill, where he published, like we published George Ellenbogen, and his first book was published, you know, I think after Leonard Cohen's and uh, in, in that, in that, that series. germinal series yeah, that, yeah. that Louis had. But, and Louis had literary magazines, little magazines, and he had his press, two DC, DC books. Louis also, at a time when regular newspapers used to review books and review poetry, the Montreal Star used to review poetry, Louis was a regular book columnist, and Louis never pulled punches, he was never personal, but he would say this was good writing or bad writing, and I think what happened is a lot of people, his books, when we published them, got merciless reviews. I mean, they were like... Payback. They were horrible. Just (laughs) horrible. It hurt him greatly. I mean, he never won a prize. He never, you know... It was just uh, uh, sad. And then when McGill turfed him out when he turned 65, he was in a depression for a long time. But he was... You could drop over any time. He would... I still have this image of him in the kitchen steaming the teapot to make it hot before he made the tea. And he was just like a very generous guy. I brought my daughter over. He would teach her how to play chess. You know, he was he was a very very sweet man. What has there has there been much written about him? Like, is there a biography of him? I don't think so. I don't. Quite frankly, I don't know how many copies it would sell. It sounds to me though like that's what you are able to do yeah. is you want to publish something that mm-hmm. you think has merit, even if it's not yeah. marketable. Because his role was incredible. He and or Leighton and Ray Souster were Contact Press. Yeah. I mean, look, yeah well, look look what Contact Press published. Yeah, everyone, you know, he, he, everyone. He, no, nothing else to yeah. say. You know, he made an amazing contribution just yeah. through that press. Yeah. Well, it was the launch of modernism in Canada. Yeah, absolutely. Really. It was the beginnings of like of the different camps. Because you're absolutely right. Sivan is, is is taken from Ezra Pound's civilization is not a one man job. You know, there's there's other schools of of writing, particularly poets, who just you know. We're not into that uh, school of, of writing. That book was an important book when we when we did it for me. I don't even know. We have maybe two or three copies. 
what we should do is post that bibliography that you gave me on on the site so people can mm -hmm. identify yeah, sure. uh, and, and and use it as a list to go after, you know. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so what's next uh, on the pile then. there? This is sort of like my... Uh, greatest hits. Greatest hits. Yeah. Well, not necessarily greatest, but these are just books that sometimes reflect a, a change in the press, a transition or whatever. Sure. Like, this was one of the first two books that we printed our... We couldn't print ourselves anymore because they were just too large. What I love about this book, this, this book was brought to us, and this is... Spreading Time, Remarks on Canadian Writing and Writers, 1904-1949, mm. by Earl Burney. This was brought to us by Ken Norris, who was an, an editor at the press at the time. And Earl delivered us a pile, basically, of radio talks, reviews, essays, all in chronological order. But, you know, Ken and I looked at this and we said, this is interesting in a certain sort of historical way, but not a very interesting book. Kind yeah. of dry and boring. So I remember asking Earl Earl, could you write an introduction to the book? You know, giving us, because it's chronological, it starts with this, I think the first review, or, let's see, it starts in 19, oh no, 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 no. Oh, yeah, yeah, unpublished essay, 1926, the half-Canadian poet Charles G.D. Roberts. So we said, Earl, could you write us an introduction? Well, it turned out to be this, pre what we call a preface, and it's 1904 to 1926, spring plowing, he calls it. Mm. And it goes back to him being born on in the homestead, basically on the prairies. And so then he just matched it all together, everything. He filled in. So that went from... What do you mean he matched it all together? Well, basically the first piece in the book was 1926. So he took us, brought us from 1904 to 1926. Oh, okay, yeah. His next review was 1937, that we chose called Moon Wist and Canadian Poesy. And so we said, that's, quite a, that's quite a leap, could, isn't could, there? I wonder what he did for those 10 yeah, years. Or, yeah, or, or, or we didn't have the material no, or whatever. Okay. So then he did, as I remember, from 1926 to 1936. Oh, so he's this, interspersing it. This with, uh, ended up being his only memoir. He never wrote a memoir. Oh. So to me, it's, we just did something almost accidentally. But you've, it became you've something done a really duty. valuable. Yes. So it takes us from 1904 to 1949. And then he had sent us the next batch and then he had a stroke and he never you know could have never ran do it thing. so isn't that amazing so you it starts here with him and his mother's greenhouse in 1904 in morning morningside, morningside alberta. alberta there you go isn't that great yeah so to me this was like someone who was sort of a, a bit iconic for me and it was just wonderful meeting with him and it's a nice he, picture too he looks yeah. very like santa claus there doesn't he with his, yeah. his his white beard this is the second edition oh okay uh, first edition so you sold out of the first edition, which is good. Yeah, yeah, and you know, working with Earl was just amazing. I mean, I have wonderful letters from him, which I use in my class. In my class, when we were at the point where we're discussing the title of a manuscript, okay, how manuscripts come with titles from from authors, and sometimes they're great, and sometimes it's like you're saying, "Oh my God, no!" And uh, you have to kind of be diplomatic and work at it. He sent these wonderful letters of suggestions, of sort of like candlelit in the ruminations in the candlelit swamp or whatever. I mean, they were just amazing titles, the one we ended up with. Well, that's yeah, terrific. Neat. Yeah. What year is this one? This is uh, 1980, and then another, the revised edition in 89. And I have to tell you, I've learned a lot over the years about topography, because these were, te I have to say, I mean, they were, te I, I, I look at this and I cringe, because I would never do anything like this. Uh, Why? Maybe it Why? reflects the time. What's I know, the problem? Well, because my standards have changed. So this is the You mean one. they've improved? I would hope. I would hope. And you just don't like the way this is laid out? Well, I think I've become a better because I do the I do I'm I do all the typesetting even now. Right. And okay. I would just want to look at the inside. But look at this. These are the these are the the first edition. Well the first edition you've got a hardcover. Hardcover and, and paperback. And how many of these hardcovers would you have put out? Oh probably probably about fifty or sixty. No, no, that, not that many then. No. Really, yeah. well, that's that's rare. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, because we would just sell the libraries, they stand up to a beating. What now? How many how many of the books did you do in hardcover and in uh, paperback? Well, in the earlier years, there was like there was a library market. Okay. You know? yes. Now they don't. The library market has kind of disappeared. I see. I mean, they'll buy paperbacks now. We don't do any library editions any any longer. But like, because I mean, the completionist is going to have to get all of the hardcovers as well, <laughs> right? Yes. I mean, here, like, we love doing. We have published all the works of um, Philip Joseph Aubert de Gaspé. Yeah, this is like a four hundred and sixty-page book hardcover dust jacket. 
published in 1988, cloth and paper, and translated by Jane Brierley, who's got to be, she won the Governor General's Award for us. On this. For this? Uh, uh, no, she was shortlisted. Uh, I love de Gaspé. Why? Look at look at his lifespan, 1786 to 1871. Yeah, it just covers an, an incredible period true. in Canadian history. And he was a great storyteller. Hmm. And he remembers back to his what parents was he? and grandparents. What was he, like a gentleman of leisure or what? He was a, a seigneur, you know, yeah, <laughs> really. Okay. And then, you know, this is his memoir. So what, this would give you a bit of an idea of life on the... Oh, look at, yeah. well, look at this. Yellow Wolf and Other Tales of the St. Lawrence by, by de Gaspé, okay. translated by Jane Brierley. And this is about, he's remembering as a, tra- as a child, meeting Indians... Uh, native people living along the shores of the St. Lawrence. Yeah. You have like incredible stories here. Yeah, firsthand. As as a white man, and and they they spoke to him. This is an older guy. He's meeting like chiefs and getting legends from them. I just feel this is just fabulous, you know. And that's what I enjoyed typesetting this. I typed it in the old style kind of. You know? Why do you think it's fabulous? First of all, he's out of fashion. So I, I, I loved bringing someone who's sort of out of fashion. You know, or just not very well known. No, well, I think historians know who he is. And, okay. and, and I think but you literary, want to bring into literary the history. Eye. I wanted people to read them. Yeah. And so we've published everything that he's written, essentially. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and we had, like, one of this country's great how did translators. You, how did you find him? I think Jane Brierley okay. brought him to me. And sometimes in this country... Translators act almost as agents, because okay. she and had, she lived locally, it, and she read it him in she, French, or, or what, exactly. Yeah. And she said, you know, okay. and so we did his memoir, and we did his, we did this, we did this book. So it must have made a real yeah. impact on you, then. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. and uh, I mean, and he's a good writer, obviously. He's an excellent writer. And he did a book called Canadians of Old, Les Anciens Canadiens, which we put, we she also translated for us, and it's just a great story of the conquest, because right. it was about a French Canadian and a Scot who are like Buddies. best of friends. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I have to mention is, you know, we're really on the fringes of publishing, in a sense, in Canada, English Canada, because we're situated in Quebec. Yeah. And it's kind of lovely to be on the, I think, to be on the edges. To Why is so, that? It gives you, first of all, a perspective, I think, of, of, of Canadian literature. It's funny, living in Quebec, it's, it's, to me it's like living, it's like looking down the mountain at everybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's a certain... As we all know, connectiveness but isolation. Because yeah. Quebec, the language thing makes mm-hmm. a difference. Being an English publisher in Quebec yeah, well, it makes gives it you kind of rare right at the right at the the onset, yeah. the, at the get go. Yeah, right. And it gives you a different perspective of the country, obviously. Yeah. Now these um, these are not, and don't take this the wrong way, but these aren't finely printed books. No, I know what you mean. No, they're nice to look at, but they're basically the idea is to. Get the text out in a reasonably a trade attractive paper, trade paperback. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But but you didn't. So you didn't do the type of work that Coach House ventured into. No, never. With no. with because they did some exquisite oh, things. Yeah. And it's never it's never, never been our it's never, never been, been your interest. your objective. You know, no. Other than other than you know things like vegetables or some of these early sure. kind of funky uh, things yeah. we did at the okay. beginning. Right, right. No, it's never been it's never been my interest. Um, I mean, we've, we've you're, but you're you're primarily interested in the content, and, and yeah, packaging no, no, it and in good an design. Way. No, yeah, yes. absolutely good design through and through. Yeah, but not not in terms of like fine limited edition printing. It's never been our thing. This book here is called Painting Friends: The Beaver Hall Women Painters by uh, Barbara Meadowcroft. It's a nice looking uh, you book. Know, I like to chronicle not just literature, and this has like a one. If you look at the inserts in the center, I mean, okay. what's what's incredible about the Beaver Hall group is that these were all women painters oh, yes. who most of them earned their livings as art teachers in you know colleges and, and whatever. They have an incredible body of work. It's gorgeous, too, isn't it's it? It's gorgeous, it absolutely. Really I mean, we, what we did is we, we tipped in a, a section of a printed on, on high-quality gloss paper, color reproductions. Exquisite. It's a book I'm very proud of. And uh, it's not the, just the quality of the it's book. It's well-printed. Uh, you can yeah. tell that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's, it's also, to me, one of the things that I'm in, I enjoy, do, you know, we enjoy doing at the press. Well, there really is a theme coming out here, and this is that, uh, is that you want to bring attention to people who are accomplished things that mm-hmm. should be celebrated. That, that were the, yeah, that made a contribution, and you'll notice, I mean, look, we're, we're a national press. Uh, I mean, most of our, in the past number of years, our, 
are writers from across the country, from you know Vancouver, or Winnipeg, you know, name it, Newfoundland. We love Newfoundland poets. Yeah. But one of the focuses of the press has been Montreal, the Montreal connection, the Quebec connection. It's mostly Montreal connection. English Montreal. Yeah, to yeah. Canadian literature. And then we've also done to translations from the French in, in terms of poetry, too. Yeah. So look, at we're an English language press here in Montreal. We have our ear to the ground, and, and you know, we, we have some exciting stuff happening in the next year or two, where we're, we're doing some amazing translations of really contemporary stuff. I mean, this is something that should be a natural, because we're here, right? It, it should be, and in fact, it is a cliché, the two solitudes. But really, we don't know what's going on no. in Quebec literature, or the arts in general, but particularly literature. And it's odd, you'll meet some, a, a, a Quebecer who will have a set of th- their top ten greatest authors... Uh, from Quebec, and here's us. We, we don't it'd know. be unlikely if we'd even heard no, one yeah. of them. Yeah, they could be in tremendous bestsellers. But I suppose that's part of what you're doing. Well, when people. we when we published someone like Pierre Neveu, if Pierre Neveu was English, he would be up there with like Margaret Atwood. I mean, he's like an incredible poet. Not just a poet. He's mm. an essayist. He's a poet. He's such like so mm. incredibly. Yeah, I've never heard of him. Dimensional guy. Incredible writer. Right. But a little it, less so now, but when you publish many of our, our authors that we publish from the, from the French, who are well known here, it's like publishing a first time author that nobody's ever heard of, right? Yeah, so it's, yeah. like, it's hard to get them stocked in the stores, yeah. and it's like, it's crazy. And I mean, obviously, it, you need to make sure that that quality of the language is translated into English in a way that, that does justice to well, that. Well, that's what's exciting about what, what we do as publishers, the matching the, the right, right translator yeah. with the book. Yeah. And also, we have such a, a group of tremendously talented translators in this country. Mm-hmm. And what we're, we're, we're trying to do in the next couple of years, too, is to continue with the established translators, but to also match books with young translators. Yeah. And have yeah. to sort of bring on the new generation. New guard, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so Painting so Friends. Painting Friends. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so okay. next up so, is Poetry well, Nation, yeah. the North American anthology of fusion poetry. Well, you know, this is like well, fusion, in this case, I guess they mean like spoken spoken word. And we looked for spoken word that worked well on the page. Yeah. And fusing the two. Yeah. Yeah. And just to give you an idea that, you know, you have to always explore new things, things that are happening. And this book, I mean, went into a couple of printings, it was very successful. Mm. You know, half of them were American, half of them were Canadian. Right. But what's really good, Reggie Kabiko knew Allen Ginsberg's lover. And we got to print an unpublished poem because there's a part of the book which which honors the, the pioneers of this of sort of the genre of spoken word or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, Ginsburg. and it's dedicated to it. It's for yeah. Allen Ginsberg yeah. and Ian yeah. Stevens. Yeah, and, and so they provided an unpublished, po- previously unpublished poem by Ginsberg. Mm. And, and it's a who's who of, of people who are then spoken word. Well, I see you've and, got uh, David McGimsey yeah. and uh, Evelyn Lau. Yeah. I love, Crosby. I love the cover. It was done by another designer, Don Stewart. So again, you know, it's just, I, I'd like to bring this out as an example because it just shows that it's important to um, to look at different things and, and, to stay, and to stay fresh all the time. You have an imprint called Signal. Right. Maybe you could tell us a bit about uh, how that got going. In the early 70s, essentially to qualify for the Canada Council, we had to have an editorial board. So we put one together. We had, as our first editors, Ken Norris... Artie Gold, both poets. Artie Gold's now deceased. Andre Farkas, who later on became Andre Farkas as he sort of discovered his Hungarian roots or wanted to assert his Hungarian roots, were our poetry editors. But then at a certain point, and this has been written about, I should, I don't know if you know this book, Book Language Act. I've seen it, yeah. 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 Anyway, in Language Todd Act. Todd Swift, edited by Todd Swift and Jason right. Camelot. There's some history in there. You'll, you'll find Andre writes it from his point of view. History uh, of what? History of, 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 of literary things in, in English language, literary activity in, in Montreal and in Quebec. He gives his rendition of sort of his history at Vehicle Press. Just from the perspective of someone who wants to learn about the press. This that, book would be, would be good. Would be think, good, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very pleased to publish that book too. It was a very important book. Andre was approached by the editors, and, and Andre basically writes, I think he writes about Simon's fuck you letter. I think it's how he refers to it. But basically, back in the 70s, we wanted to do more than just poetry, and we suggested at one point that Ken stay on, Ken Norris stay on, and that, that Andre and, and, and Artie not. And Ken wouldn't because out of solidarity with his friends. But there was a bit of a, you know, we didn't speak to each other for a little while at that time. It was such a long time ago. Because we really wanted to do more than just poetry period so 
when Ken left, we needed to have a poetry editor, and that's when, you know, so Michael Harris came on. And for Michael, we decided to create an imprint to mark the, the difference between the previous Vehicle Press poetry books and the ones that he's publishing for Vehicle Press. So we created Signal Editions. You'll and notice at the back of every literary, every Signal Edition poetry book now, it'll say founding editor Michael Harris, and the current editor is mm-hmm. Carmen Starnino. And Carmen still has been since since 2000, I think, has been. You'll, okay. And Carmen is still our editor. He's a wonderful poetry editor. He is. He's a, he's a terrific critic, too. It's a Absolutely. great fun to Absolutely. read his uh, books of criticism. And this, the new canon, his anthology, and anthology of Canadian poetry, has gone into about four or five printings. It's, it's, it's really great. Hmm. And we are talking about now, another generation now, of marking another generation with this book. And when, when was this published? Uh, check the date, I don't remember. Yeah, okay, let's see. 2005, right. and a second printing in 2006. Oh, but it's, print, it's been printed last year again. It's been again. printed many Is it times used in... in uh, it's used in schools. Schools, yeah. right. So, and then 10 years ago, we created Esplanade Books to be our fiction imprint. And Andrew, after 10 years, uh, stepped down last December. His last book is New Tab, the novel that just got this great coverage in the Gazette that I showed you today. It was a really a, a lovely, strong strong finish for Andrew. And now our fiction editor is Dimitri Nazrella. And we're, gonna, we're going to be announcing this fall some really, I think, some exciting stuff. Just a change, and change is, change is good. Yes. Well, you're 70 years old now. I know, sorry to believe you. And my sense is that by doing what you've done over the last 30, 40 years, yeah. it's kept you sharp and motivated to continue. Yeah. What else has this experience done over the years for you? Well, it's given me the ability to uh, be around my kids as they grew up, that's for sure. Because you're your own boss. My own boss. We have two, I have two full-time employees. Right, and they work out of the house here in the basement? That's right. Vicky yeah. Marchuk here works as general manager. Okay. And Maya Aswad in the other room does the marketing. marketing. Okay. And Nancy, co-publisher, does... Your wife. Takes, my wife takes on uh, two or three big projects a year. Right. And she's working on a couple right now. So it's really quite a nice balance. And also, Nancy being an archivist has definitely influenced already the interest I have in terms of historical stuff. We've published two of her books. In the field of, of what, archives? The scholarly practice of it? Or? No, 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 no. No? Nancy's a specialist in nightlife in Montreal. Oh, wonderful. So she did Stepping Out the Golden Age of Montreal Nightclubs, oh, which goes back into the 20s, 30s, right up through the 50s and the 60s. I love it. And a, a very showing... interesting combination of how we all... Here we have the front and back of the menu at Club Deauville at Chez Maurice, 1937. Right. And I think, actually, the Montmartre is in there, and that is where Vehicle Press... Started out. Started out. So you'll great? see a great picture of the Montmartre, great picture of the showgirl. All the stuff is from the Concordia University archives. Which they is have, a great literary destination, right? Yes, and, and historical stuff on nightlife in, in Montreal. Montreal what a, yeah. They have, I think, about 2,000 photographs from this guy, Al Palmer, of, of just like exotic dancers. <laughs> what a great career, right? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so yes, that's, yes. that's one of Nancy's. And I mean, this is great. So Nancy being co-publisher, I mean, she brings another aspect of the book. Yes. And here's a book we published called Montreal Photo Album, Photographs from Montreal Archives. Montreal Archives is the Montreal Archives? No, various archives. They can okay. be religious, the CPR, whatever. Sure. And, and the whole idea was they were approached and said, provide us with you, what you think is the most unusual, important, or not known photograph of Montreal. Right. So you end up with an amazing collection of photographs, and with great annotations done by Nancy. And we actually got Pierre Neveu to do a preface. So seeing so, a Montreal that's not often seen. And ex- again, exact, that's, exactly. isn't that the theme? Well, it sort of yeah. connects with the literary, Exactly. Too. Yeah. But on the other hand, we're doing also very contemporary literature, too. And then Nancy and I did a book on the Scots of Montreal, the Italian and the Jewish guy become the experts on the Scots of Montreal with the McCord Museum okay. and the show that was on there. So this was, this was great fun. The McCord has the Notman collection, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. which a lot of these come from. Oh, also. does it? Okay. Yeah. Nancy's contribution is really qu- quite wonderful. She injects this um, historical perspective that sort of, as you mentioned, parallels the literary. Bringing attention to yeah. what needs to be yeah. celebrated. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's that's admirable. That's why I'm here. That's why, you're that's here. why I'm Finally. here to bring attention to what you've been doing. 
So uh, thanks very much for sharing Pleasure. your story with us and uh, continued success. Thank you. And behind you, you well, everywhere, David Drummond covers. Right? That's right, yes. We don't want to forget David Drummond. I mean, take a look at no. this. Look at this cover. Oh, I did see that. Isn't yes. that a great cover? Yeah, it's called Dog Ear, and you can imagine what's going on with the pages in the paper. And this one is one of my uh, favorite. I, Remember I told I, you I did You a, sent that to me, yeah. Because, you see, I looked at that, and I went, oh, that's nice, nice yeah. cover. Mm. I didn't see the shoes. No, no. And then is, you see the shoes. Yeah, and you go, this is a bull with, with women's sort of high heels as the shoes. Satin white uh, Yeah, Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's outstanding. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, really. <laughs> He plays word and image games with us, doesn't he? He does. I mean, look at this. Isn't no, that, he, I, he's, this is, you know, uh, yeah. Huh. No, I mean, we don't want to get too gushy here, but no, uh, but David lovely. Drummond yeah. is is a world-class yeah. uh, cover designer, and you had the foresight to hire him, really. They're just so much fun. And he's such a lovely guy to work with. Yeah, one of my goals is to try and encourage a, a, a culture of collecting mm -hmm. in the country, mm -hmm. and collecting David Drummond covers. It's quite a it's quite a number, yeah, but you know what? They're you know it's just a joy to <laughs> yeah. to you know to look at them, and yeah. uh, they're so much fun. And, and he's award winning not just in Canada, but to, you know in the states and I'm sure around the world. So listen, can I give you a couple of books? I'd, uh, I mean, let, that's to music give, to my ears. Yeah, publishers love to give away books. Okay. You know, as long as it's not rare. But, but first of all, just let me thank yeah. you again for your time and uh, continued success. Well, thank you.